Hello everybody, this is Mike Sadlowski, CPS Science Coordinator, and in a minute, Reagan Webb, another CPS Science Coordinator. We're here uh, for another edition of the Science Show. And today we're gonna make soap. Hopefully all of you use soap uh, in, in, to get your body clean, but what exactly is soap? So soap is something called a surfactant. You'll, you may never remember that, but to be a soap, it has to be able to take oil away from your body. In other words, it has to be attracted to the oil, but at the same time, kind of pull that oil into the solution. And that solution would be like the soap water or the, the sudsy water. And so if you look over here, these are all the things that we're gonna be using to make our homemade soap. You may be surprised to find out that soap is made from fat. So when you take a shower or a bath, you're rubbing, kind of, you're rubbing fat all over your body. But that's not gonna be good. That's just gonna be a greasy mess. And the fats that we have we're using today we have some shea butter. Most of you know butter is a fat. We have coconut oil. All plant and animal oils are fat. We have sweet almond oil and we have olive oil and castor oil. So we have all kinds of different fats here. There's many different recipes. Back in the old days, they used chunks of animal fat. And it, it, your soap was a little chunky because it didn't completely break down. When, the, uh, when we take the fats and we add a very, very strong chemical. This is a very strong base as opposed to acid. This is the other side of acid. So it's a very strong base. When this base gets added to the fats, it breaks the fats down into uh, different, or I'm sorry, not different oils, into a sub substance called glycerin and soap. And what soap is, is actually just the salts of the fatty acid that was in the fat. And it's those salts of the fatty acid that we call soap. And now when you wipe that all over your body. It's gonna grab the dirt and the oils that like to stick to your body, take them off and flush them down the drain. So let's get started. Hello, I'm Reagan Webb. I'm the elementary science coordinator and I'm here to help you make soap. So our first step is to take our solids, which we have our coconut oil. We're putting in 425 grams of coconut oil. That's this one. And putting it in our crock pot that's on low. And then we're taking 170 grams of our shea butter, butter and putting it in here in our crock pot on low and gonna have that melt. So while that's in there melting, I'm gonna move over here. And in this container, I have just distilled water, 425 milliliters of distilled water. And I'm going to pour that, uh, how many grams did we put in here? We put in 400 and, or 204 grams of lye. And so I have gloves on so that it, if it doesn't burn or this is not good to touch on your skin. So I'm gonna dump that in there. All right, and then we're gonna stir it up. With our fancy stirrer, known as a knife. And I can feel the I'm getting more resistance, less liquidy as I stir and feel the powder at the bottom. And then if you can see that. Huh? An interesting thing. Uh, like, can you see this I was gonna say, uh, I was just gonna bring that up. I don't know if you can you can see the condensation at the top, and so I can't see the steam in the camera, but trust me, it's, there's, it's steaming. This is getting quite warm, and so just to the touch, I mean, that is a hot, uh, it, it, I could touch it, but I couldn't leave my hand there for more than maybe five, 10 seconds. Uh, that's called an exothermic reaction. It's the sodium hydroxide reacting with the water molecules, H2O, and then releasing quite a bit of heat. Also a little bit of a color change there too. Yeah. All right, so we're gonna keep stirring for a while and uh, then we're gonna come back. But we also, at the same time, while she's doing that, we have to, you already see that our solids are melting down. We need them to, to melt a little further. And while that would make some an exciting five or 10 minutes, we're just gonna pause it for you and we're gonna come back for the next step. All right, we're back. All our solids are now liquid. So you can see the nice liquid there. And now we're gonna add our liquid oils. We're gonna start with our 425 milliliters of olive oil. Pour that in. 
And then we are gonna add our 340 milliliters of sweet almond oil. And finally, we're gonna do 43 milliliters of castor oil. That's very slow pouring. This is castor oil. The only thing I've heard it used for is my grandma used to tell me they used to give that to you when you had an upset stomach and make you throw up and feel, mm -hmm. feel better. So yep. interesting fact about yep. castor oil. That's the only yes, thing I've heard is. of. Um, and then if you look at our lime mixture here, you can see a big color change while we were waiting. It's still warm to the touch. And we're gonna pour that into our mixture here. Remember, this is what you're cleaning yourself with. <laughs> okay, we're gonna give that a stir. Oh, and it's already starting to solidify a little bit. Wow. Oh gosh. Wow. And actually, can we switch for a second? Because I think this is when I'm supposed to use the, or somebody. Okay, oh yeah. All right, now we just have what's called an immersion blender. And we're gonna blend all this together. And I'm gonna go ahead and put it on correctly. It's brand new and obviously I didn't. There we go. We're gonna get that good and mixed up. cooking our soap and it's in kind of a play-doh like texture so we're gonna put it scoop it from here and put it into our mold where it'll harden and then we'll cut it into bars of soap so we're gonna scoop it in here this is gonna be quite a big mold but you can make several bars of soap out of one mold okay well our soap was done kind of and uh, we didn't cook it enough, I don't think. Mm -hmm. And so it is soap, but it's pretty crumbly. And my daughter, because I can't really, I have a little cast here, so I can't really wash my hands. So we're going to show you it does work though. So we're going to, she kind of squished some together. <laughs> she's going to, she, she, she's not a big fan of how it looks. All right. And she is washing her hands and it's, completely dissolved <laughs> however we know what we did wrong and that's part of science and we'll we'll do it again next time um this i don't know if this this may just make it to the trash i'm not sure all right until next time bye bye hi my name is liz kalanda i'm a student at mizzou and today i get to talk about two of my favorite things science and ballet i'll be discussing the physics behind balancing turning and jumping to start with turning, according to Elaine, centripetal force is the force needed to make something move in a circle. In the video, I provide the initial force by pushing off the ground with my back leg. From there, centripetal force keeps my body rotating in a full circle. Friction is the resistance of one surface or object to moving over another surface or object. Turning on the tip of my point shoe allows me to use less force to keep me spinning because the tip of the shoe is covered in a satin fabric which reduces the friction between the floor and the shoe. According to Hall, center of gravity is the average location of the weight of an object. In the photo below, I was able to find my balance by finding my center of gravity. And with each of these arrows, you can see the center of gravity of each of the dancers and the tightrope walker. When it comes to jumping, according to Baird, Newton's third law of motion states that to every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. When the earth pushes on you to send you into the air after jumping, you also push on the earth with the same force. In each video, I exert a force on the ground with my leg, which propels me into the air with the same amount of force.
And that's all I have. Thank you so much for listening and I hope you have a great week. Hi everyone, this is Megan Stolting from the Planetarium bringing you a night sky update for spring 2021. So towards the end of March every year in the Northern Hemisphere, we have our spring or vernal equinox, which is our first day of spring. On the equinox, we have equal day and equal night because the sun's rays are pointed at Earth perpendicular. They're coming at Earth perpendicular to Earth's axis. And then the northern hemisphere will begin to tilt towards the sun, Earth's north pole axis will tilt towards the sun as we get closer and closer to summer. And now in the southern hemisphere, remember it is opposite. So on our vernal equinox, they are beginning, they have their autumnal equinox, so they begin fall. Springtime also means that we have some new constellations in our sky and old winter constellations are setting in the south and southwest. So first we're going to look towards our southwest sky. We have our S for south and SW for southwest and we have some named stars over in this area in the southwest. We have Sirius, Rigel, Betelgeuse, and Procyon. Uh, and you can see if I turn our constellation outlines on, we have uh, Orion the Hunter over here with his belt of three stars. The star Betelgeuse is in his one shoulder. And opposite down here, Rigel is his knee or foot or whatever you want to call this down here. We also have the star Sirius in the constellation Canis Major. You can see the little dog outline here for Canis Major, the big dog. Sirius is a very special star in our nighttime sky. This is the brightest star we can see from Earth in our nighttime sky. So the brightest star we can see from Earth besides the sun. Remember the sun is the brightest star in our sky even though it's up during the daytime. But Sirius here is that special star. It's going to be setting along with Orion in the west and southwest probably by the end of April. So we will not see these wintertime stars uh, anymore. So we have about a month left of these stars in the sky. Now if we turn towards the eastern sky in the southeast and eastern part of the sky, we can see our springtime constellations. I'm actually turn our constellation lines off first. So first in the eastern part of the sky, I want you to look for a backwards question mark next to a triangle. So the backwards question mark next to the triangle is the famous springtime constellation Leo the Lion. Once Leo is very high in the sky, this means that spring is officially here. Sometimes we say spring comes in like a lion and that is that comes from this constellation Leo. You might also see very close to Leo, you might be able to pick out, if we go over here towards the left side of the screen, we see three stars in a handle, four stars in a cup for the Big Dipper. However, if I turn our lines back on, you can see there's a lot of extra lines to this constellation because this is Ursa Major, the Big Bear. Remember the Big Dipper is right here, but that's not officially a constellation on its own. It's what's called an asterism or a star pattern. So Ursa Major is the constellation and the Big Dipper is just a part of that constellation there. Uh, we can see the Big Dipper not just in the springtime, we can technically see it all year round because it never sets. It's what's called circumpolar. Uh, so it never sets because it is towards the North Star. However, in the springtime, because the Big Dipper is so close to Leo, that's the best time to see it. So you can still see it in the winter, it's just halfway below the horizon and very hard to see. So I like to look for Leo in the springtime high in the sky and then also look for the Big Dipper. So if you are outside and want to see some springtime constellations, look for Leo the Lion and also look for the Big Dipper very close to Leo. 
So thanks everyone for listening to my update. I hope you catch some of these stars and constellations outside very soon. Hello everyone. I know Liz and I have both made segments in past shows about COVID and the COVID vaccine. Maybe you're tired of hearing about it, but there's a lot of science behind all this pandemic chaos. And it's important for you to be informed about what's going on because well, this pandemic is kind of a big part of our lives right now, no matter how tired of it we are. This week's COVID topic answers an important question. Why are some people feeling sick in response to the COVID-19 vaccine? It's a good question. It might be scary to think that a shot that could keep us from getting sick is actually making us sick. Well, as Liz talked about in a past science show, vaccines are made up of some part of a virus or a weaker form of a more dangerous virus. The substance in the vaccine is very similar to the actual virus to make our immune system respond to it the same way it would to an actual virus, but it's not the actual live virus that can make us sick from the disease. In the case of the Moderna and Pfizer COVID-19 vaccines, the shot is made up of genetic information from the spike protein of the coronavirus. So the vaccines do not actually contain the live coronavirus that can make us sick with COVID-19, but only a strand of the mRNA that contains the information to produce one part of the virus, the spike protein. So if we were to ask the question, are people getting sick with COVID-19 after getting the vaccine? The answer would be no, because the makeup of the COVID vaccine cannot give someone the whole live virus that causes the disease. So if it's not COVID-19, then why are people feeling sick after getting the COVID-19 vaccine? So these vaccines are pretty much just a way to give our immune system valuable information about the coronavirus without us having to become infected and sick with the coronavirus and getting sick with COVID. But our immune system has some built-in ways to fight off foreign invaders, even if they are just those pesky spike proteins from the vaccine. When our immune system is activated and is gearing up for war against these foreign invaders, to us, it can feel like a fever, fatigue, body aches, etc. These are all things that make us feel sick, yes, but they're all signs of our immune system working hard to make us not sick. So actually feeling feverish or sick after getting the COVID-19 vaccine is actually just a sign that the vaccine is working and that our immune system is learning about the coronavirus spike proteins. So the sickness that some people are feeling after getting the shot is not COVID-19 or even the genetic information in the vaccine, but rather it's the body's tough immune system gearing up for war as if it was infected with the coronavirus so that you're protected later. Not everyone who gets the vaccine is getting sick afterwards, but that doesn't mean that the vaccine isn't working for the people who don't get sick afterwards. It just depends on the person and the immune system. For those that do get sick, the side effects usually just go away within a few days. So our immune system is pretty incredible. And so is science for being able to figure all of this out too. I'm Henry Gross, and this is the weekly hour of power. This week we're going to show you some of our favorite feeding videos. So, Kaylee and Tatum are going to give you some things to think about. Thanks, Henry. Watch closely. What do you think the prey is? Try to guess which meal was a Dr. What do the owls usually do before exchanging food? Do you notice anything about the eyelids? Can she breathe when she eats?
March 5th, she took two meals in one and a half hours. <laughs> And on March 9th, she ate four birds in four hours. Which could mean that when it can, an owl packs food in the gizzard until it's full. And food could mean one, two, three, or more animals. <laughs>
hear what they were saying. Thanks, Kaylee and Tatum. I'm Henry Grove. Tune in next week for more Stardom Revelations from Our Box Lunch.